Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here with Fabio Drugel. Fabio is a eight-time, nine-time world champion and uh, a huge influence on my jiu-jitsu because back in the day, like in the late 90s, you released this VHS set. It was like 15 volumes long. You'd show a technique and then you'd do it from four different angles and then slow-mo in four different angles. And I loved jiu-jitsu, but that was just not condensed enough for me, so I went through and edited with two VHS decks. It took forever. <laughs> All the techniques were just technique, 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 technique. But at the time, it was hands down the best instructional out there. So thank you very much for being such a huge influence. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure being here. Just to correct you, I'm just four times world champion. Uh, the, other, the, other fifth, the other five is from the Masters International, which you know, I don't really count as a world title. So once that I have won the, the, the world championships four times, that's what they really count. But aren't more and more tougher guys fighting in the Masters now? I mean, all the guys who used to be winning in the adults are now graduating up there, and they're older and slower, but up here they're still technically Yeah, I'm not saying dangerous. that's not important title. It's very important, but I don't, I don't, I don't think you can compare oh, okay. with the adults' division, division with, which is the... You know, we're most pro more professional, and that's the title that everybody wants to have. Right. Uh, and you say that, oh, Fabio has nine world titles, and then Malfacini has ten, but his ten is, is for real, right? <laughs> ten, ten world titles in adults division. So that's why I don't count the Masters. You know, it's a separate thing. So we can say, okay, I got five titles in the world, on the International master because the World Masters is a brand new tournament. It just started four years ago, mm -hmm. right? Before that was uh, International Masters, which we considered the World, world Masters, but right. it wasn't, you know? And uh, so then we have a, a, lot, a lot of important tournaments like Europeans and uh, Brazilian Nationals and all that. You've also been in ADCC. And ADCC and all that, but the, what's important when you say, oh, what's the most important titles you got? Definitely is for forward titles. I do definitely want to go down the jiu-jitsu rabbit hole and talk about training back in the day and talk about your achievements and the achievements of your team. But the way that my cohort of jiu-jitsu fanatics first got to know you pretty much was when you fought Mark Kerr. So Mark Kerr at the time was the smashing machine, mm -hmm. giant wrestler on every steroid known to man then, um, just destroying people. And you had a really good fight with him. Yeah. So how, what did it feel like going into the ring against this you monster? You know, the first, uh, in 96, I fought the UFC 11 against Jerry Bolander. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was, I got really frustrated because he held the fence all the time and it was a 15, min, uh, 15 minutes fight long and was a draw and they give the decision to him. And so I went back to Brazil, I was really frustrated uh, and uh, a promoter say, hey, I want to put a show in Sao Paulo, and would you like to fight Bolander again? I say, of course, man, yeah. let's do it, you know? So we started a conversation, and uh, they set up the fight, so we're going to get a revenge, and it's going to be nice, and they promote the fight really well, and the last minute, Bolander decided that he wouldn't fight. So as he said he wouldn't fight, I was ready to fight, right? have been training for that to that fight for a couple months and said, okay, man, if he, if he doesn't, doesn't come, I will go for the tournament, you know? I will do the eight-man eight tournament. The guy said, okay, so we're going to put you in. I didn't know who was in, right? And then I remember the day that we, we were on the, on the weigh-ins. I saw Mark coming with the, his, his coach was Richard Hamilton. The same, same guy that used to train Mark Coleman and Don Fry and all these guys. I said, man, this guy is something, right? He's not, he's not a, just a wrestler. He probably is, is a good, good guy. I didn't research anything, you know, because I, I would fight him next day. So I just, I just realized that he would be probably the best, you know, the best opponent that I had in the time of the tournament. So we fought, we fought twice before with different guys, so I faced Pat Smith in the first and then Michael Pacioli on the second, and then I got to the final with Mark Kerr for a 30 minutes fight. It was a good one. That was all one day? <laughs> yeah, one day, no, one, same yeah. night, yeah. like straight. You know, you, you, 
you fight, you go back to the locker room, you go back to fight again. It's like a jiu-jitsu tournament, you know. Mm -hmm. But that that's the way that it used to be in the yeah. time, right? The even people, the UFC was like even that. the UFC, yeah. The people think that three fights was okay. <laughs> <laughs> and the other guy has an easy fight. You have a long fight. You win. Exactly. It sometimes it happened, right? So uh, I didn't have uh, long fights that day, uh, and Marquette didn't have any long fights too. You know, he fought like maybe five, six minutes each fight, but in the end, it was pretty long, right? Yeah. In the end it was pretty long. It was half an hour straight, non-stop. We didn't get out of the ring for any second. You know, it was 30 minutes, really non-stop. Yeah, I mean, it was a lot of time in your guard. Yes, most of the time in my guard, yeah. I would love to be on top for yeah. a second, but <laughs> <laughs> I just couldn't make it, you know. It was a, it was a really hard fight, and uh, I remember that. Well, how much did you weigh at that time? Uh, I weighed 87 kilos, and he weighed... Uh, 125, right? Something like that. So About. mid 200, uh, mid 200 pound. Yes. 260 I, or something. I, yeah, I, I I was like less than two, you know, 200 pounds, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And was he the strongest guy you'd ever gone against, or were there other strong guys in uh, training who had simulated that for you? I think he's he was the strongest. Yeah, he was the strongest because it's not about the strength itself. It's just you know. He, he knew how to move. He was an athlete, you know. Mm -hmm. He's not that guy that you feel very strong, but then he yeah. get tired in five minutes and then there's nothing. He, he was a world-class athlete, you know. Mm -hmm. So it was a, was a tough fight. I remember the, the, the point of the fight, I was really tired already, pushing him away from my guard, you know, and it's like doing a leg press forever. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, I looked to my corner and asked for the time, you know. Mm -hmm to see what we still have left. And the guy said, man, you still have 12 minutes to go. My legs were burning, you know. I said, come on, if I keep that pace, it would be impossible to go to the end. Right, right. right. So from that point, I just relax and I let him pass my guard, defend. I, I start spending too much energy. In the end of the fight, I was better than that point. You know, mm. so it was really important for me to understand the, the limits. You know, sometimes we think that we are getting there. Oh, it's really close to my limit, but it's just about changing the the way you're thinking. You know, so it's, 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 of course it's inside your mind. You know, your body can handle. You know, you just need to to understand that. Just change a little bit. You know, say okay, if I cannot push you for that long, mm. let's see what you're gonna do in the different way. You know. So let me relax a little bit. So that the fight uh, uh, kept going, and uh, in the end of the fight, I was kind of, you know, fresh. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, that, and it's just about it. It was a really, really important lesson for me. Okay. All right. Now that wasn't your first Valle Tudo fight. I mean, the UFC wasn't your first Valle Tudo fight mm -hmm. either, because you fought in the early '90s yes. before the UFC. Yeah, the the '91 Valle Tudo against Lutalivi guys was the, I think, the most important one for me, because it was all about defending the Jiu Jitsu flag. Right. That was how I been raised in Jiu Jitsu. Uh, Listen my the stories, you know that. Jacare used to tell us, you know, about the people that, you know, that fight to defend the jiu-jitsu name and all that. So when I had the chance to fight, was a, I was very honored, you know, to say to represent the, the, the jiu-jitsu community, you know, to be one that Carson Grace chose to represent was something really big for me. Okay. So you were, at the time, training with Jacare mm -hmm. as your main teacher, and I want to go into that. Yep. There's yet another thing I want to go into <laughs> later. But talk a little bit about training with Carlson, because I met him mm -hmm. once, and, I mean, he was the fighter, really, mm -hmm. of the Gracie family for mm -hmm. a very yeah. long period of time. Yeah. Carlson was a really special guy, and uh, I used to compete against his students all my life, right, since the very beginning. He was, uh, he had the best team in that time, Biggest and the most tough guys were were from Carson Gracie team, so I used to fight with all of them. And, but I always kept a really good relationship with Carson, with a lot of respect, you know. And uh, and for some reason he he, he liked me. Uh -huh. So when the when this all 
this thing of the the, the Vale Tudo came out, we were in the tournament. I was warming up to fight the final of the Open Division against Amaury. That's in uh, Jiu Jitsu. Jiu Jitsu, yeah, yeah. yeah. it was yeah. a Jiu Jitsu tournament. And the guys from Ruta Livre just went through the tournament to accept the challenge that Valide has, you know, had put on the on the press. What did Valide? Valide Ishmael. Valide Ishmael. Valide Ishmael. He just put on the press that, you know, he was challenging everybody for a fight, you know. And uh, when in that time when someone uh, from Jiu-Jitsu say that, it means that Jiu-Jitsu was there for everybody. If you want to challenge Jiu-Jitsu, you can just, you know, just say it. Mm -hmm. So the Jiu-Jitsu, the Luta Livre guys, they went to our tournament to accept. But they went with like 100 people. It was a really tense moment. Mm -hmm. I remember I was warming up to fight the final of the Open Division against Amori. And uh, so we stopped the tournament, so the guys went to the, to the small room to discuss the terms of the, 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 the challenge and all that. And, uh, and my, na my name pops out because I was, you know, in the final of the Open Division. It was yeah. natural that, you know, I would be one of the guys to, you know, to put my name. So my name was there and Casa said, okay, so we're going to train. And we're gonna start next week, and the team's gonna be like this, you know. So we had Amaury, Murilo, Marcelo Bering, and uh, Valide, and all the Carson Gracie team, and all the Jiu-Jitsu community. They, a lot of people, you know, went there to train with us. Right. And it was a unforgettable time, you know, to be led by Carson and. Uh, so all of a sudden, train. all the rivalries between the teams. <laughs> Just Together. disappear. <laughs> and now just disappear. Imagine yeah. that I fought a Maureen that day, and next week we are training together. <laughs> okay, here's you know? my favorite technique. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> like that, you know. So we help each other a lot, you know, and uh, it was really nice for for everybody in terms of friendship, mm -hmm. you know. So uh, nowadays I have Murilo, Liborio, Amaury, Zé Mario, all those guys that used to be my opponents mm -hmm. and just opponents, and they became friends, really close friends, and uh, we, we kept that way to nowadays, you know, which is good for jiu-jitsu as a whole, you know. I think that that point we start in the, in the past is different than today, was different than today. Today we see uh, the top level guys compete against each other and they are close friends. And that time was different. Mm -hmm. We got, a, you know, uh, some distance for the people that we used to face in the competitions. Mm -hmm. And this time just broke us, you know. Okay. We just got along and became friends. So what was training with Carlson like? What You'd show up and you would do what? Oh, man. We, we, we did many different types of training. Uh, but what caught me attention and what I think is important to to deliver it to, you know, to our audience is that Carson was probably, he was the best coach in Jiu-Jitsu ever because the things that he said was like, were like very simple to understand. Carson uh, was able to tell you exactly what's going to happen in three steps. Hey, this is what's going to happen. This, this, and this. Simple like that. There is no, you know, mm -hmm. small details that doesn't really matter. You know, he was straight to the point, you know. I guess he had so much valetudo experience exactly. compared to everybody else. So forget about this. So sometimes we are doing some drills and some techniques. And the guy said, hey, come on, forget about this. It's never going to happen, you know. So focus on that one, uh -huh. you know. So one training that we used to do a lot is like, okay, you stay on bottom, you have a line, and the people start to rotate two minutes each, trying to hit you as they could. You know, you have just to defend yourself from bottom. And we do that like for 15 rounds of two minutes, like half an hour on bottom. Yeah. Maybe the kind of training that saved me with, with Mark uh, mm -hmm. six, seven years later. And uh, so you know, uh, you understand how to protect yourself during the whole time, you know? And he usually he used to say that, man, if you were on top, the fight is over, you know? Mm -hmm. If you'll be able to put the guy on bottom, you know, and start to do jiu-jitsu on top, you're gonna kill the guy, no question. The problem is when you 
not able to put the guy on. You know, you're mm -hmm. not able to go on top. So you need to play on bottom. Then it's much harder. So that's why we're going to train. So 80% of our training, I would say that was on bottom. That's so funny because Carlson was known as being a top fighter. So you would, it's really interesting to hear that how much he emphasized the bottom, but you're saying it's a worst case scenario. Yeah, the thing is, if you look to the Carlson's fight, there's a fight that he did against, I forgot his name, but he fought for five rounds of 30 minutes, you know, was something unbelievable. And he fought on bottom because he has 75 kilo, kilos and the guy had 120. So, of course, he would love to be on top, yeah. but sometimes you just can't do it, mm -hmm. right? So he, need, he, he played on bottom and he hit the guy in the eye at the same place for like hour and a half to the guy quit. So the fight's supposed to be three rounds of half an hour. Five rounds of half an hour. And he fought like three and a half hour rounds. So at the time, I, I don't think many, some of the people won't understand the rivalry between Luta Livre, the no-gi guys, mm -hmm. and the jiu-jitsu guys with the gi. And from reading the history, it sounds like every time there was a fight, there'd be a big negotiation. Are we going to do this fight with the gi, without the gi? It sounded like the Luta Livre guys developed the leg lock game focused on that a little bit more because it was no gi. Is that correct? And did you have to worry about uh, that? You know, I don't, I don't, I don't think that Duta Livre guys, of course they use more heel hooks than we do because at certain point, uh, heel hook wasn't allowed anymore in tournaments. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we, st we stopped doing that that often, but that's the only thing that it, you know, I remember that was different because leg lock came out later, a little bit later in that time, you know. We we didn't have leg locks, you know, till I got my black belt. I don't remember, you know, the, the people using leg locks. Uh, it was much more, you know, arms and chokes, you know, the legs are like, the people don't really didn't really pay attention too much in, the, in those attacks, uh, which is different nowadays, right? The jiu jitsu became anything that you can get it, get it, you know, because mm -hmm. maybe you don't have any any other chance, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so the people start to develop a lot of leg locks and foot locks, and you know, but I don't see the Luta Livre guys bringing anything different to the to the scenario, you know. Okay, so you didn't have to worry about that no. more than normal. No, 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 not really. Okay. Well, there's people who talk about old school jiu-jitsu mm -hmm. and modern jiu-jitsu, and a lot of people go, oh, that old school jiu-jitsu, that's the way to do it. New school is crap. What's your opinion on old school versus oh, new school? Oh, man, that is no, that is no old school and more than jiu-jitsu. That's, you know, I think that people are very wrong when they try to divide jiu-jitsu in two. Uh, jiu-jitsu is a constant evolution, you know, and... Uh, what we used to do, you know, back in the days, uh, it was good for that time, but you can really compare with what the guys are doing today, you know. Jiu-Jitsu nowadays is much more effective, much more, you know, precise. Uh, so uh, it's, it's just better, you know. What about the people who say, oh, that invert, the barambola would never work in the street? Try to pass Miao's guard, and you're gonna get your answer. You know, yeah. uh, the thing is, every technique you can apply it depends of the timing and the situation. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm not saying that if you wanna fight Miao in a Valitudo, he would go for the Berimbolo right away. <laughs> but you know, at certain point in the fight, maybe he's gonna use it. You know. Well, I saw it being used in a MMA fight. Somebody pulled it off. It was in a scramble, and they ended up standing up. But in the end, he got the back. That's so the it, thing. it has happened. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and that, it, 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 you cannot really say, "Oh, Berimbolo is the modern jiu-jitsu." It's not. It's just one technique. Right. Right. It's the same with fifty-fifty. Oh, fifty-fifty is, is bad. I don't like fifty-fifty at all. But sometimes it works. Mm -hmm. You know. I saw one time Serginho Moraes winning a fight in Valitudo with a 
footlock from the 55th guard, you know? So anything can happen, right. all right? You need to be prepared. And my point is, jiu-jitsu that the people are doing today is way better than what jiu-jitsu that we used to do in that time. No, is there is no way to compare that. What are some examples of how it's better? Because people want to say, well, how is it better? In, in every way, in every way. The point is, what the people try to do, you say, okay, oh, in that time, we had more self-defense. Or in that time, the people used to go and, you know, submit the guys, or all that, right? Uh, which is not true. In my time, the level of submissions were lower than today. Really? Really. You know, the people uh, used to stall the fight much more in that time because we didn't have the rule that you cannot stall, mm -hmm. right? So uh, the techniques now is much more, you know, uh, uh, precise and effective and it's just better, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's evolution. What, what I see is the people that don't want to really test themselves with the young generations. They want to stand in a, in a place that's safe, you know. They say, oh, my time is much, was much better, you know. Oh, the old The old, the old days when every man was a man and exactly. every, every child listened and to their parents. Sorry, it's just, it's, it's just people that stop training, you know. If you keep training, you cannot really uh think that way you know you can't you can't say that the guy uh that someone anyone 20 years ago was better than Malfacini today because what Malfacini does if he does what he does 20 years ago he would be like a witch you're gonna burn him you know <laughs> <laughs> right because it was it would be something so so different from outer space for our space yeah. you know see so he would cons be considered some you know some alien or something like that so that's the evolution you know you cannot really fight against us you know so all this 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 says oh no old school and this and that sorry man it's, it's bullshit i've heard that you know there are techniques that we think are old school jiu jitsu like the triangle choke say but I've heard that the way that the triangle choke came into jiu-jitsu was when Halls Gracie looked at a judo book mm -hmm. and saw that. I don't know if that's true, but that's the story I heard. Uh, so that's an example of evolution of the old school. There was evolution back then, I'm gonna, too. I'm going to tell you something. That is a two different uh, phases in jiu-jitsu. If you want to... It's not the old school and modern school. If, if we can find, uh, you know, a line to separate jiu-jitsu in two, this line calls Halls Gracie. You know, he was the one that brought to jiu-jitsu different techniques, from judo, from wrestling, mm. from anything. He was a searcher, you know. He was fascinating to, to, to discover new things and bring to jiu-jitsu, you know. So that exactly what he did. Coincidentally or not, the two biggest schools in jiu-jitsu came from Hall's Grace School, right? It's Jacare and Carlinhos Grace, mm -hmm. the Grace Barra and Alliance. So we have the same line and same open mind to learn, right? So if someone from, you know, any school or any martial arts teach me something that I think is good, I'm going to bring right away to my students. We're going to start to work on that technique, and that's how jiu-jitsu keep evolving. Mm -hmm. You know, so when you say open mind, it's obviously being ex open to new techniques coming in from sambo or some, something that some blue belt invented. Yep. But is there anything else to having an open mind in a jiu-jitsu context? I mean, you allow your students to train at other schools. Yeah, of course. Well, that's, they, no, that's not that's not a given. There's lots of schools that don't allow that. Yeah, I th I'm gonna tell you why, because the instructors are afraid that the guy go there and see something better than him. That's why they don't allow the students to go, right? Because what's the reason to, you know, to avoid your guy to learn something new, you know? 
It's just one thing. You were afraid to lose that student because you are not providing, you know, the same technique. You are you got stuck with that old school mentality that, you know, all the knowledge must come from you, which is a liar, right? You cannot really provide all the the content that your students need. So as So you haven't taught Bruno Malfasini, Marcelo Garcia, Bernardo Faria, everything that they know? Of course not. <sighs> <laughs> of course not, you know. I was the one that provided them a lot of knowledge and the open mind to learn from anyone. Right. You know, and in any moment, Marcelo Garcia thought about leaving my school or Malfacini or Bernardo Faria or all those guys, you know. So there's no reason for that, you know. Right? Uh, so being, a, being instructors is a way more than just teach them some techniques, you know, and... Uh, Providing an environment. Environment, uh, you know, be a, a good counselor, you know, and try to put them in the right track, you know, and teach them the, the best way. Say, man, look, I already went to that road. That was scrap, you know, mm -hmm. go this way, you know. So that's, that's what the... the, the what I think that good master should do, you know, instead of trying to hold the guys and and uh, and don't let them fly, mm -hmm. you know. So you've worked with so many world champions and helped mold so many world champions. How differently do you treat each one? I mean, obviously, some guys are going to need more pushing. Some guys you just let go. Is that is that a correct? I try to treat everybody as as the same. I think that the problem is when you start to when you start to individualize the treatment you start to treat someone better than the other and then you create a, you know a bad environment I meant more the type of training that they do I meant more that sort of the some guys need to be I've, I've noticed that some guys really need a coach to yell go 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 and other people you just let them go because that's how they perform best so you still do the same? I still do the same, okay. you know, and the people have, they, they need to get what the, what, what the information is good for them, what type of, for example, let's say that I'm teaching a, a spider guard in that day. It's something that Bernardo never used, right? It's not his game. Mm -hmm. Of course, he, he needs to understand, he needs to, to play a little bit, you know, but that day was open guard training. He's going to do the same thing that everybody's doing, you know. Okay. It's going to be good for him in a way, you know, even though he's not his game. Right. Bernardo is not doing all the time half guard, you know. He's his best game, but he has a lot of things behind that that the people cannot see, right, because he has been forced to train with everybody, you know. So I try to treat everyone as the same, and to don't point the egos, you know, because that's the problem when you have a lot of champions training together, you know, you have to control the egos to make, you know, to make the environment nice for everybody. Well, certainly that was one question, because I told people and went online and said I was going to be talking to you, and there were a lot of questions, mm -hmm. no way I'm going to be able to ask thank you, all thank the questions, you. <laughs> but one of the questions was how, I mean, you're a world champion, but there's lots of world champions. But not every world champion has built a team and managed to keep a team mostly together. I know there have been some ups and downs in the mm -hmm. Alliance, but I mean, the last 18, yeah, 17, learn. 18 years we have learn, been. Yeah. So maybe talk about keeping a team together and also being a world champion, you can develop other world champions as opposed to a world champion and the line ends there. You know what? Uh, since, I, since the beginning, when I was 15 years old, I decided that Jiu Jitsu would be what I want to do for my living. So I decided that, and in that time, the only way to make a living in Jiu-Jitsu was teaching. I still believe that the, that's almost the only way to do it, but anyway, in that time was the only way. So since the beginning, when I was competing and training, I was always trying to figure out the best way to teach, the best way to run a school, you know, I was helping Jacare in his school, and then we became partners. Uh, 
in, in, in school in Panama. So uh, I always had this, you know, this thing in my mind that if I want to make a good living in Jiu-Jitsu, I need to run uh, a school properly, you know. So the teaching is was always something very important to me. Besides, Even when you were mostly competing. Exactly. Mm. I used to do both. Okay. You know, I used to do both at the same time. When I was uh, the when I, I was competing, that time I used to teach 10, 11 classes a day. Wow. A lot of private classes, group classes. When the guy, when the guys uh, used to come to train at noon, which is the competition training, uh, I had had like six classes prior to that training, you know. The guy was just coming fresh, <laughs> and I was there the whole morning teaching, <sighs> you know. So, uh, uh, but that, that, that's the only way that would be possible to build what I have today, okay. right? So then, when I stopped competing, my school was already something, you know? I had built something strong, solid, you know? And then, we kept from there, you know? And, uh, and of course, when you, when you have a team, a competition team, and uh, you have a lot of egos, and it's not easy to deal with all this, you know? Uh, these guys that, you know... They're all alpha males. Yeah, They have exactly. to be able to train that hard. But we need to, to make them understand that nobody is bigger than the team, you know? No one. And they need a team to get where they want to, mm -hmm. right? So it's, a, it's exchange, all right? And, uh, but not like, it's not exchange in terms of, hey, this is a negotiation, you know? It's just like make them understand that if they contribute for their environment, that's going to be better for themselves, you know? So, uh, are you talking about, I mean, Alliance mm -hmm. is known for sending instructors out to different schools or seminars. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Like also the that, you know, what, what is the thing? You need to provide them some opportunities, right? Uh, otherwise they're going to get a point and say, hey, man, all right, you know, I love you, you know, the team's great, but I need to I need to make a living, mm -hmm. so I need, if I have no opportunities here, I need to, to go some, somewhere else. So what we did, the system that we built, is to provide them the opportunities, mm -hmm. you know? So they go for seminars as they like, you know? They have a full schedule all year round if they want to, you know? Some guys, uh, they, they get to a point that they say, man, you know what? I don't wanna travel anymore, man. Let me stay, you know? Mm -hmm. So let me try now to, to, to find a place to set up my own school. That what, that's what happened with Marcelo, Cobrinha, Lucas, Malfacini, all these guys, you know? And uh, Michael, that is in my academy, and Thomas here in Vancouver. All these guys, uh, uh, you know, we just provide them a good opportunity to, you know, to keep working with Jiu Jitsu in a good way and be inside the team and make the team stronger. I guess it's structuring the whole system to be win-win, not yeah. just win for you and yeah, that, that, lose that, for everyone. Of course, the, the, the system that is a win just for one side mm -hmm. doesn't work. You know, it's already proved that it doesn't work. You need to, to really provide something that is good for everybody. So the lineage, your lineage is Halls Gracie to Jacare to you. I mean, of course, mm -hmm. you've had other influences. Yeah, of course. So did you ever train with Halls? No, okay. Unfortunately, not. Okay, I didn't have a chance. As soon as I, when I start jiu jitsu was in 1983. Holly was passed away okay. two years before. So describe training with Jacare then. What, what was the training like, and what did you? What are the big lessons that you learned from him? Man, Jacare, in my opinion, is is the best instructors I could ever have because, of course, he has an incredible technique straight from Halls Gracie, you know, which is, uh, which was the best in that time. Uh, but on top of that, he's so generous, you know, in terms of making you, make the students better than him, right? So, Jacare is always about, man, I'm going to teach you everything that I know, and if you get another opportunity to learn from somebody else, go there and, and get it, you know? So, uh, he always 
ran his school in a in the really nice way, in a really uh, uh, comfortable way to learn, you know, and uh, and man, that's what that thing that you that you need in order to you know good instructor, good techniques, and open mind to let you fly, you know. Don't try to hold the guys under your umbrella, you know. So that's why it took for me uh, in order to treat my students. And uh, that's why we have what we have today. So you trained with Jacare, obviously. We talked about Carlson. Who else are the other big names in jiu-jitsu? Hickson was a big influence to me, too. Hickson, in my time, was the best guy. And I had the chance to train with him for several years. And uh, I used to travel to California every year to train under him. And uh, he taught me a lot of stuff, a lot of different concepts, you know. And uh, and was really important to me, too, you know. So I think Hickson was the best guy that I ever trained with. When you say trained, you mean studied from or rolled with? Rolled with, trained from, <laughs> whatever you okay. whatever you say. You know, he's a... He's a He's a true samurai, you know, and uh, he was a really, really important influence to me. You know? and, uh, and I had this opportunity because Jacare was training under him after Hollis died, so we got a mm -hmm. good relationship, you know. He opened the doors to me, and I could learn from him for many years. It was it was amazing. Because it's been so long now that he was competing and was active that a lot of people don't believe the hype anymore. Ah, he couldn't have been that good. Oh, he was just, that's just those guys building him up so that they build themselves up. So, how good was he? <laughs> the thing is, I remember the day when I, I was a black belt uh, open weight champion at that time, right after that tournament that I mentioned before. And uh, I went to California to train with Hickson. I spent like a month over there. And when I came back, the people, hey, how was the training, you know? Did you, you know, how was it? I said, man, it was a hell, you know? The first row that we did, I tapped nine times. You were world champion? No world champion because there was no oh, world right, championship right, sorry, at that time. But I was a champion okay. in the black belt open class, okay. you know? And, and uh, the guys, no, man, you lie, you know, it's not possible. I said, man, what's the reason that I lie, you know? If I could tell you, oh, I tap him 10 times, I would love to, <laughs> right? But uh, that wasn't, wasn't the truth. The truth was that he tapped me nine times in one fucking training, you know? That's how good he is. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was so happy with the opportunity to learn from him, mm -hmm. you know? And I kept going there and training, and of course, that some, some trainings were, you know, were okay, and some trainings were, was bad. It's like a regular training, you know? You don't talk about training. You know? Doesn't matter, but he's he, he's definitely the best guy in the time, no question about it, you know. And uh, and of course, you cannot compare the guy that you know close to his 60 years old with a young talent, you know. It's, yeah. It doesn't make sense, right? Apples and oranges. It's, yeah, it's not fair. It's like comparing Pelé with Cristiano Ronaldo. Come on, it's different times, mm -hmm. you know. In my time, in what I see, what I could feel, Hickson was. For the best. Who is the guy who impresses you the most now? I mean, that's just, you're going to alienate your students because you have so many good students. Okay. Uh, I won't talk about my students because, uh, of course, there are many and they're great. Uh, I just spoke about Malfacine a little bit, you know. Uh, but out of my students... I like the way that Roger plays. Uh, I think he has a very effective jiu-jitsu. Looks simple, but of course it's not. You know, there's a lot of techniques behind that simplicity mm -hmm. that he shows. Uh, that's the way that I like. Uh, I used to love watch Rodolfo fighting. You know, I think he's a killer. Uh, it's very impressive the way that, you know, he used to fight, and uh, I really like his style. What else? There are so many you know, very good guys, you know. It's, uh, 
that I can mention. Let me see another one. Uh, Romulo Bajau is other, other, other example of athlete that I like. Not just because he's a great athlete, because he is, but also for the whole example that he is for the Jiu-Jitsu community. He's becoming a very important instructor. You know, the way that he treats his students and how they behave in the competition and how aggressive they are at the same time they are gentle outside. So that's something that I, I admire as well. So all these super good guys, including guys like Malfasini and your students, because you, know, you have... Companions, Lucas, Marcelinho, Michael Lange, all the... <laughs> <laughs> you got to name, name. to name, yeah. Is there anything that connects them all? Is there anything that a similarity that they all have? The guys who make it to the very top level? Yes. So probably they don't know, but yes, there's something that makes them different. Uh, which is one concept that we try to put in our school since the beginning. To make our students understand what connection is. And what those guys have different than the others is the timing of connection. What do you mean by connection? By connection is that when I do some move, uh, we are fighting. And I do some move, I expect you to do something in order to counter the move. So you try to pass my guard with... Knee slice. Knee you're going to gonna put a shield. That's, that's the, 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 your, your defense for what I'm doing, right? And jiu-jitsu is all about solving problems. So when you create a problem, my reaction time to solve that problem is the connection, right? It means that when I go a new defense and I apply another technique on top of that, I'm ahead of you. Now I'm closer to my goal than I was before. So you need to do another thing. And if I know already what you're going to do, and I'm able to apply another technique on top of that, I'm getting closer and closer to the submission to win the fight, right? Those special guys, they have it almost naturally, you know? Sometimes they don't really know that they have it, you know? But of course, it's something that you can train, you know? You can... How do you train it? You train if you understand and you connect the moves according with what your opponent is doing. That's the way that you should train. It's the way that you should understand jiu-jitsu. You know? If you just go there and try to apply what you're thinking, what happens is if the guy has a good counter for your techniques, you don't go any further, right? You, you get stuck. You do one technique and the guy defends, you say, oh, what now? And what now the guy is doing another thing that you have to defend, so you, you keep yourself behind. And if you are behind, means that before you attack the guy in order to win the fight, you have to come back to the even point. If, you, if your opponent doesn't make a mistake, it's not possible to, you know? So it's, a, it's all about those connections that make you special, that make you better in jiu-jitsu. When the guys, this, just answer your question, when you have those good special guys and you look Deeply, when they what they do, you you can see that for every reaction that the opponent has, they have something right away. So it makes it look like they have amazing reaction time, and maybe they do, but it's accelerated by the fact they've looked at every response that they're going to. Get. They're going to do the knee slice. The guy can do this. The guy can do that. The guy can do that, and have an answer to each one of those, and have an answer to the next exactly. question as well. Who's the best guy in jiu jitsu? is not the guy that knows more techniques. It's the guy that connect more techniques that they already know, right? So it doesn't matter the amount of techniques you use. You can see again, you can give an example. Roger do something very basic, few techniques. He doesn't really use much things, right? It's just ask the guy that, you know, one, two, three types, different types, and then he mount and choke the guy out. His connections are perfect. And you train this, the reaction speed, you drill to get that faster and faster and faster and more precise. But the understanding is the key. 
I need to have the understanding in order to apply the reaction fast and precise. So understanding means understanding what the other guy is going to do mm -hmm. or the exact details of where you put your hand and or... Both. You have to understand what your opponent is going to do and what you're going to do next. Mm -hmm. And when you do something, let's say you, you put a shield, I put another technique on top of that. All right, we are back to the point that you can do something. You're going to react in some way to try to defend the technique that I'm doing. What are you going to do next? after your reaction. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a non-stop process to the point that someone tapped. And hopefully the first time that you're being asked that question is in the training room, not in the tournament. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're, you're going to learn the way in another. <laughs> totally different topic. How did you get that scar in your forehead? Oh, man. I was a kid, you know. I was oh. playing with my brother and uh, oh. it wasn't, wasn't in the fight. No, we, need you know? a, we need a better story. No, we need a better story. <laughs> the story is cool, you know. I yeah. just jumped from the, from the couch to the, you know, to the table in front of me and hit the head. I was five years old. So know? a lifetime of fighting. No scars. And no, the no biggest scars. scar you have is jumping off yeah, of a couch. Exactly, uh -huh. exactly. Uh, so how is your game changing as you're getting older? Because you've been doing this a long time mm -hmm. and unlike a lot of other instructors, you're still out there mm -hmm. banging with the young guys. I'm trying my best, but it's being hard every time. Uh, of course, you need to change your game. Uh, of course, I always had a top game. That was my main thing. And I still prefer to stay on top. But the problem is with the time, you, you start to lose uh, the reaction time. You start to lose explosive. You start to lose sometimes, not the the, the strain. I don't think that you know, I'm I lost a lot of strain, but you 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 lost the you know the reaction time, and then some techniques that used to work for you, it it, it doesn't work anymore. So you need to adapt, you know, and most important than anything. You need to understand that you cannot compare yourself with the young guys that are out there training for competition to be the world champions. It's fun to train with them, but you need to, to focus in your own improvement, you know? What I can do best today, you know? And not try to win the training, you know? That's, that's something that you have to have when you are a competitor. When I, when I used to compete, man, I don't want to lose any, any role. It's, it's, it was a very important mindset for me. But nowadays, I don't really care that much, you know? The only thing that I care is I'm able to keep doing what I love to do, mm -hmm. you know? So you adapt your techniques, you know, you do whatever you need to do to, to keep rolling, you know? That's the most important thing. Well, a friend of mine who's in his late 50s, early 60s, described it once at his age, his only goal in training is to come back the next day for more training. See? So if that means tapping 10 times, it means tapping 10 times. Yeah, no problem, you know. And uh, I can say that for me, it's, it's not an easy task to do because I got used to win, I got used to that level. And uh, when you don't have it anymore, what do people usually do? They stop. And they start to say that old, old times were, you know. <laughs> old times you, were the best times. So you, 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 we go back to that point that we were talking before. Uh, I try to, to avoid that as with my, you know, old energy. So because I don't really believe that. I don't want to be the, the guy that was, you know, sitting on the couch and criticizing the people that are doing, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and they are, you know, making jujitsu. Uh, uh, grow and uh, and be what it is today. So I want to be there, you know. But in, what about the guys who are like, ha ha, I tapped Fabio Giorgel. Well, congratulations, right. man. Yeah. Good for you, you know. And what's the problem, you know? It doesn't, it doesn't make you better than me if you tap me, right? It doesn't make you better than you. It doesn't make, it doesn't make you better, you know, just because you tap me. It's not, it's not a big deal anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe it, 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 it wasn't some time in the past, but it's not anymore, you know? The, the, my goal is, man, I want to keep doing this mm -hmm. for real, you know? I don't want to be the guy that's sitting on the couch 
you know, <laughs> saying something. Yeah, oh, just, 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 just for time. the interview. Yeah, just this time. <laughs> I want to be the guy that is on the mat, training with my guys, you know, having fun, keep evolving, you know, mm -hmm. trying to find new way to train, you know, and don't get hurt, you know, and try to make a, a good example to my students. And that's what I believe, you know. And if I tap, what message I'm telling to my students, you know, man, you know, that's normal, you know. Mm -hmm. No problem to tap. But next day you have to come back and fix this mistake. You know, because everybody who tap, you made a mistake. So try to correct, mm -hmm. you know. And then you go back and you tap in a different thing, then you correct. And then you go that way, you know. Having fun and doing jiu -jitsu, that's that's the most, thing, the most important thing. Mm -hmm. So... We're in uh, Alliance Vancouver right now. You do a lot of traveling, going around to different schools. What's that like for you to be always be traveling? I mean, traveling is hard on the body sometimes, hard on the energy, but on the other hand, you get to see the world. So, yeah, man, you know what? I'm glad that I had this opportunity to travel all over the world, you know, and, uh, and through jiu-jitsu, you know, what I choose, you know, to make a living. And uh, I'm really happy what we, to see how far Alliance is going and uh, what we're building in terms of uh, not just having more schools, but touch people's life in a really nice way. Uh, that's why we try to make our, our instructors understand that's the most important thing is what you give to your students at the end of the day. Uh, so yeah, it's sometimes hard to be away, you know, for, for, you know, for the family, for, you know, but it's a part of the business, you know. You have to do it, you know. Mm -hmm. I like to do it. Sometimes it's hard, but why to I'm, achieve something? I'm, I'm still, I'm still, you know, young. I have energy to do it, you know, and uh, I'm happy to do it. So then, what's next for you, and what are some of the projects that you've got going, and where do you see this all going in the next five, ten years? Uh, what I'm doing today, what I realized that's very important. Uh, is that we need to share with the whole jiu-jitsu community some, some things that we learn. And uh, so I decided a year ago, I started a project that calls uh, Viver de Jiu-Jitsu, means live of jiu-jitsu, that helps the jiu-jitsu instructors to understand how to run their business. So it's, it's been really nice to work with people uh, that choose as I choose to make a living in jiu-jitsu, but we, don't ha we didn't have any source to, to understand how the business should be. Right, you're a black belt, you're and not that's a, it. a black you belt know? in jiu-jitsu and a white belt in business. Exactly, so how can we help those guys, you know? Uh, we had a big change in Alliance in, uh, in the close to 2000 when we decided to build our methodology for group classes, and it was a really important change for the whole, the whole group, you know. We started to, to really deliver jiu-jitsu to the, to the beginners in a different way that we used to do, and it just grew our academies in the, in the very nice way. So now it's a reality in our team. So now we are open this to all the schools. Say that. Here's the way that we did. Here's how we build alliance using those tools over here. So I'm giving away for you. So that's the that's how I build everything that I have. Right? Is that a port uh, de Jiu Jitsu? It makes it's, it sound like it's all in Portuguese. Yes, yeah, still in Portuguese. We are planning to bring this wow. in English too, uh, for next year. But uh, it's a brand new project, that's right? just one year old. Uh, so we, we, give, we give the instructors uh, the step-by-step -step how to run the business, and we also add the beginner's methodology course. You know, that's two different things, but that works together, right? So uh, just to make the audience understand that Jiu-Jitsu never had a program for group classes. The first, the very first Grace Academy used to teach one-on-one -on -one classes, and that was it. You had to take about 30 or however many classes 30, 36 before 36 you... classes was a program. It's a one-on-one -on -one type of class. So really, you had to be rich to afford that one-on-one -on -one training. 
Yeah, nowadays, yes. But when the, uh, I'm talking about the way that they built the okay. first Grace Academy in Rio back yeah. in the 50s, right? Uh, so what happened was after many classes, like let's say the students were there for almost two years doing the same 36 classes. Mm. The students already knew that, you know, back and forth, right? Upside and down. So the instructors start to train with that guy. So the, the instructors start to train with that guy, to the next guy, to the next guy, and then the instructor had to train with like five, six guys every day. It was you know, really hard for the instructors. What they did, they start to invite those guys to train with the family in the end of the day. That's what they made to train between them, mm -hmm. right? So they got that, that, that training in the evening. Uh, when someone teach like one or two techniques after a nice warm up, two or two techniques and put them to roll. That was a kind of open map. Mm -hmm. That's very similar what the people do, right? All the classes in Jiu Jitsu runs basically in the same way. Warm, warm up, up, one or two techniques. Two techniques and roll, right? But this is not a system. This is not the way that you should teach your students because they don't see, uh, and what, what the instructors usually do, they go and teach what they are good at. So if I'm very, if I'm specialist in half guard, that's what I'm gonna teach to my students. But definitely it's not what they need to learn. It's your first night and we're teaching inside out clock choke and you don't know what the guard is, you don't know what the mount is, you don't know what side mount is. Or turtle. Like. And, and every time that the, the, the class doesn't make sense for the students, uh, it's a lack of, of motivation, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why the students leave. That's why the academies are shrinking. Uh, of course, we know that Jiu-Jitsu become more popular and more popular and people are getting more students. But it had happened in Brazil. And uh, at certain point, the academy started to shrink because they are not treating the students the way they should. What I'm trying to, to, to do is, A, change the way, change the system. Give your students the, the better service. Try to individualize the system for every student. So if you're a beginner, you're gonna get this class. If you're not a beginner anymore, you're gonna get this class. Or if you're advanced, you're gonna get this class. Or if you're a competitor, you're gonna get this class. So they are different animals, you know? So they must be treated differently, you know? That's the way that you're gonna build your academy in a solid way. Now, what are your thoughts on new students sparring? Because I know there are different schools and different academies and different systems that put the students directly to the wolves, mm -hmm. and that's how I was raised, and so of course that's how I think it should be done. But there are lots of schools that don't do that or they have more of a gradual introduction like just side mount, just side mount escapes and then we stop. Yeah. So what is your philosophy or Alliance's mm -hmm. philosophy about sparring? Alliance philosophy, which is of course the same as I have. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> is, that, is, that, is that the students should be uh, jumping to the wolves right away. Should not be? Or should not be. The thing is, I know that all the guys from 90s, they learn that way. I call them the survivors, right? They pass through the hell, you know, till they get that little understanding of what Jiu Jitsu is all about, and then they start to have fun. But that, the intro process was really bad at that time. And it still, are, it still is in nowadays in the majority of the academies. Because the instructor learned that way, so that's what they do with the, st the students now. Mm -hmm. uh, what I can tell you is that the class must make sense, right? So the students must connect uh, the class with something that he knows. Once the student doesn't know anything, he has to connect him with some self-defense, something that he can really understand. And then you go from there. So there is a process that takes some time to put them to roll. If you put them to roll right away, it means that the guy doesn't go there with technique. He just go there with instinct. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And I don't want to make my students use that instinct because this is completely wrong. Of course, he's going to learn sooner or later that's wrong, but I prefer to take care of him to avoid any injuries, to avoid that the lack of motivation because he's not understanding shit what I'm talking about. So give them uh, classes in order to make him understand what you're talking about before they start training. And when he start training, he's going to train, as you said, specific training, just start to, you know, start to fight for that little space. When you get out, you go back. So you start to teach them how to behave, how to, you know, to don't get panic. And little by little, they get used to that. You see, I agree, mostly. And I think that's an approach that's going to work for eight guys out of 10 or nine guys out of 10. But in my own experience, the best athlete that I ever saw do jiu-jitsu, super crazy high-level rugby player, super crazy high-level wrestler, went and tried a jiu-jitsu class and sparred that first night and the instructor caught in the triangle choke. And I think it was that sparring and like, oh, I don't know everything, that then got him to stay. If he hadn't rolled that first night, it was the first day doing jiu-jitsu, mm -hmm. I don't think he would have trained. So that's my counterexample. Mm -hmm. I, I think you're right but most the, of the time. Yeah, but the point is... Should your system exactly. be designed For to this. a special guy from rugby, which is maybe you can count, you know, five in the whole Vancouver, for example, or should you design your system to please every single one? Yeah. And to give you a practical example, last year I went to snowboarding, all right? I'm a jiu-jitsu guy, professional athlete, all that. I went to the first class. I want to learn the technique. I don't want to. I don't want to ride the 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 the, the, the half mountain, <laughs> right? I want to learn the technique exactly the way that you know they should be, and then I, I want more technique and more technique and more technique to the point I'm comfortable to go. Uh, if the guy is a professional athlete, they gotta understand that, you know. Yeah. If they are really good in something, they need that because they they uh, they will understand that that's. He, he, the thing is, you don't be, became uh, oh, you don't became a top athlete starting from there. You start in rugby, for example, yeah. in the beginning, knowing how to hold the ball and yeah. right, basic stuff. So that's the same same thing in jiu-jitsu. You net, you you gotta start from the beginning, yeah. you know. So it's not about one thing is oh, you wanna test jiu-jitsu. You see oh, you think that jiu-jitsu doesn't work. Okay, let me give you a try, you know? And then you can roll in to meet the guy very fast and say, see, it works. Now let's go back to the basics. Let, uh -huh. let me teach you. So that is how you would handle that special athlete, maybe, and, and a one-off. Yeah, but you know what? It's, it's very hair, you know? It's like it happens like once in a thousand times, maybe. I also think that was a different era when not, I mean, now pretty much every athlete has at least heard of jiu-jitsu has exactly. seen it work and can figure it out. Back in the day, like, what is this pajama stuff? Exactly. So I think it was maybe a little bit different. You know what? Too. When I was a young guy, like, you know, 16, 17 years old, uh, we used to do a lot of valetudos inside the academy mm -hmm. because the people just step in and say, hey, I want to train, I do like taekwondo, you know? And the jacaré said, okay, man, come on, you know? Just step on the mat. Let's do some. You, you can go with your taekwondo, whatever you like, and the guy's gonna just clinch and pull you down and try to submit you. No punch. Were you allowed to punch? He was no, allowed to punch yeah. and kick, but not you. Not me. Right. Just to prove how jiu jitsu was effective. You know, mm -hmm. we did this a thousand times. You know, it was kind of normal thing. Nowadays, it doesn't happen anymore. They because come in with their lawyer and their gun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the people already know what jujitsu is. Yeah, so there's no more question about it, yeah. you know? So we need to build a system uh, to help jujitsu to grow. And it's, de it's definitely not putting the guy and treating the student as a competitor. Mm -hmm. Competitor is a small piece of the whole thing. Uh, 
I don't know if you're aware of this, but all the tournaments, all the competitors represent 3% of the practitioners. 3%. I didn't think it was that small, but... Yeah, very small. Mm. So, should you run your academy for 3%? No. no. You can have it, of course, it's nice, because you skip the, the, the level, mm. uh, you know, uh, uh, moving up, and it's nice for the students, even to the white belt, know that he's, be, he's a part of something really big and the best team in the world and all that, but it's not for everybody, mm. you know? You don't go, oh, I wanna play soccer. You don't go and play with Cristiano Ronaldo, yeah. you know? You don't go to play with Messi. You go and you can play, you know? It's like, but you need to learn. It's, it's, soccer is for everybody, not for professionals. Yeah. That's well, the same that we should do with Jiu-Jitsu. Well, it's funny you're talking about a system and then you mentioned snowboarding because I did one snowboarding lesson it was in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. It was in Gestadt, which is like the biggest ski area of Switzerland. Mm -hmm. And I had the worst instructor. Basically, strap on the board, point it downhill, and his instructions for turning were just swing your arms <laughs> to turn. And of course, so I'm standing there going down this fucking giant mountain, swinging my arms, yeah. nothing's turning. And of course, you wipe out, and then you try it again, and like, think, oh, another 45 minutes of this. See? And then, you know, my brother, you know, like gave me more instruction in three minutes mm -hmm. than this bloody idiot gave me in an hour. So no system, if I'd been, maybe spent a lifetime wakeboarding or skateboarding, maybe I would have figured it out. But that's, he was teaching maybe, to give him the benefit of the doubt, to the advanced board athlete, which I was not. See, so. and, and the thing is, after the class, what are you gonna think? Oh man, you know what, snowboarding is so difficult, it's not for me. So you just leave. No. That's the same, the same thing that happens in Jiu-Jitsu. Number of times I've snowboarded since, zero. See? Never again. And in the opposite way, I did a really great first class. I just fell in love. So snowboarding is my thing now. You know, I want to go every time that I, that I can. I want to go to the mountains mm -hmm. and snowboarding. So it's all about how you, your first, first experience counts a lot. Yes. You know, so... Uh, uh, you, 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 you must give your student a really nice class that the guy really enjoy. Yeah. And being smashed is not nice. You know, no matter He'll how enjoy tough. that later. Yeah, of course. It's, that's a process. You know, I need to prepare you in order to be smashed and have fun. Yeah. Right? If you just get smashed without understanding what is going on, man, it's so frustrating, you know? So you're gonna think, oh man, this is so difficult. It's not for me. It's just for tough guys, you know. I'm, you know, I'm just a regular guy, you know. And it's not. Jiu-Jitsu is for you, you know. Jiu-Jitsu is more for you. More than for you than the tough guy. The tough guy can already fight. Elio Gracie had a say that uh, when he met some, you know, strong guys, and they were like, you don't need to know Jiu-Jitsu, man. You're already strong, mm -hmm. you know, because the people that really need Jiu-Jitsu. These are regular guys, mm -hmm. right? So, but the academy must be prepared to teach those guys, and they are not. Mm -hmm. Most of them, they are not, you know, because they are thinking, oh, the the, the nicest thing is, oh man, I want to, I want to be a coach of uh, some world champion one day, you know. Mm -hmm. So they focus on competition, and as they focus on competition, their chances. Because their school is that much smaller, and point. only one person you in a hundred can you be. Shrink, you shrink your, your school, you have less guys training, of course your chance to pick a world champion from there is pretty small. Mm -hmm. uh, Alliance has around 25,000 students all over the world. That's incredible. We go for a world championship with less than 200 athletes. Let's go for 2 1%. So 1% of our students are competitors, yeah. top level competitors, yeah. right? So that's, that's how you build a school. If you wanna build a team in order to get a, you know, audio in the world championship or something like that, you gotta grow your number of students. And the only way to grow the number of your students is, is treat the beginners well. Is treat the beginners in a nice way and make them, you know, learn step by step and be ready for, you know, for the jiu-jitsu as you teach probably today. 
So just as we're wrapping up here, you mentioned Vivir de Jiu-Jitsu coming next year mm -hmm. to hope, the English-speaking hope, world, yeah. hopefully. Uh, if people want to train with you, how do they find you? Where are you nowadays? I am in Sao Paulo every day, teaching my academy every day. Uh, and of course, I have to travel for, you know, I, I try to make it, you know, twice a year, uh, different tours. Now is I'm, I'm here in, in Vancouver. I'm going back to Brazil for a couple of days and they go to New York for another tour. And then I'm back in Brazil. Uh, so most of the time I'm in Brazil in Sao Paulo, my academy teaching there. Okay. So, but look for you on the, how do the people find out of where you're doing your seminars? Man, my, my website, fabiogogel.com.pr, my Instagram, fabiogogel, Facebook, it's not, it's not, it's not hard to find no. me. Just, <laughs> just type. Awesome. <laughs> just well, thank you it. so much. Stefan, thank I, you. It was I a pleasure, man. Yeah, I think you've given a ton of value here and it's fascinating to hear the stories about the old days. Thank you very much, man. Back my when jiu-jitsu was so much better. Oh, man, no, no comparison. <laughs>